You're listening to the Corbett Report. The dust lady photo has become one of the iconic images of 9-11. The image of a woman, shocked and disoriented, completely covered in dust from the demolition of the Twin Towers, brings the nearly incomprehensible events of that day down to a human scale. But of course the dust lady was not the only one to feel the effects of the blanket of dust that descended on Manhattan after the towers fell. In the hours, days, and weeks that followed, thousands upon thousands of victims, first responders, emergency personnel, cleanup crews, and residents were subjected to the poisonous stew of asbestos, benzene, mercury, lead, cadmium, and other particulates, from which many are now dying. Dr. David Prezant, chief medical officer with the New York Fire Department, spent seven years examining more than 10,000 firefighters, those who were at the World Trade Center site after 9-11 and those who weren't. And we found an increase in all cancers combined a 19% increase in cancers compared to the non-exposed World Trade Center group. Talk about the most pressing medical issues facing 9-11 first responders right now. Cancer. In the beginning, uh, in the first few years, it was respiratory, but now it's cancers. And this is just the first wave of cancers, the blood cancers, the leukemias, the organ cancers. But uh, in five or 10 more years, you're gonna see the asbestos cancers. There'll be another wave of cancers. and. Um, Like I tell everybody, this is a generation-long issue and a generation-long illness. Every morning I wake up, I gotta take 33 pills within the course of the day. At 47 years old, I have lungs of an 80-year-old man that would have been a smoker. People say you have to forget about 9-11. And I say, how could I forget about 9-11 when every morning I gotta take this medication and walk around with an oxygen tank? If the brave men and women who had rushed to the World Trade Center in the chaotic days after 9-11 to help with the search and rescue had done so knowing the risks they were facing, that would be one thing. But of course they did not. They had been given false assurances by Christine Todd Whitman, the EPA administrator who assured the public just days into the cleanup that the air was safe to breathe. You know asbestos was in there, it's in those buildings, lead is in those buildings, there are the... the VOCs, however, the concentrations are such that they don't pose a health hazard. As the weeks and months dragged on, Whitman, the EPA, and its officials made statement after statement after statement reaffirming that contaminant levels were low or non-existent, and that the air quality in Manhattan posed no public health concern. We now know that these reassurances were outright lies. On September 18th, the very same day that Whitman and the EPA were encouraging New Yorkers to return to work, the agency detected sulfur dioxide levels in the air so high that, according to one industrial hygienist, they exceeded the EPA's standard for a classification of hazardous. By that time, first responders were already reporting a range of health problems, including coughing, wheezing, eye irritation, and headaches. The evidence continued to pour in that there were serious health concerns for those in and around Manhattan, but the information was suppressed almost as quickly as it was discovered. When a local lab tested dust samples from near the World Trade Center site and found dangerous concentrations of fiberglass and asbestos, the New York State Department of Health warned local labs that they would lose their licenses if they process any more independent sampling. When U.S. Geological Survey scientists began performing tests on their own dust samples, they were shocked at the alphabet soup of heavy metals they found in it. They forwarded this information to the EPA, but the agency continued to assure the public that there was no evidence of long-term health risks. The drama continued to unfold as information poured in about benzene, lead, and other environmental toxins. Yet on September 18th, the EPA specifically advised the public against wearing respirators outside the World Trade Center restricted area. Then, just two weeks later, the agency distributed respirators to their own staffers at the EPA's Region 2 building on Broadway Street. As scientists, industrial hygienists, 
and even other government officials began to accuse the EPA of covering up the true extent of the problem in New York, the agency continued with its dogged assertion that the air was safe to breathe. It wasn't until 2003 that the EPA's own inspector general revealed that the White House had been editing the agency's press releases all along, finding that the White House Council on Environmental Quality influenced, through the collaboration process, the information that EPA communicated to the public through its early press releases when it convinced EPA to add reassuring statements and delete cautionary ones. When new documents were released to the public in 2011, on the eve of the 10th anniversary of 9-11, it was discovered that this editing was even worse than originally feared. There were, uh, there were clear warnings, specifically on Water Street, which for those people in, in this area know is not far from Wall Street, that showed that the, the levels of contaminants in the air were too high for people to go back. That was removed, which was bad enough, and then replaced with an, a recommendation that people go back to work. They were urged to go back, uh, even though the, uh, the early samples were uh, showing that there were high levels of contaminants. And, and you point out also that in many cases they were telling people it was safe before they had even f uh, finished conducting initial tests. <laughs> in, in, uh, in one email exchange that happens on the 13th, so it's just a day and a half later, um, the people in Washington at the White House uh, Council on Environmental Quality are telling the people up here, hey, Christine Whitman is coming up. She's going to talk to reporters because all the results so far have been so positive. Well, all the results so far showed almost nothing because there were almost no results. And yet they were, they were, they were committed to this message of reassurance despite the facts. And that's not the way it should happen. Outraged at the fact that they had been lied to and their lives put at risk, residents and workers in Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn sued Whitman and the EPA in 2004. In a 2006 ruling allowing the class action lawsuit to proceed, Judge Deborah A. Batts of Federal District Court in Manhattan excoriated Whitman, finding that her baseless assurances that the air was safe increased and may have in fact created the danger to people living and working in the area ruling that the EPA did, in fact, make misleading statements of safety about the air quality, Judge Batts said, The allegations in this case of Whitman's reassuring and misleading statements of safety after the September 11, 2001 attacks are without question conscience-shocking. Batts's decision was overturned by a panel of judges in 2008, who ruled that misleading the public and contributing to the health problems and deaths of untold Ground Zero workers was not conscience-shocking enough to override her immunity from prosecution as a federal agent. If Whitman has a conscience at all, it is evidently not shocked by any of these accusations. She has not only never conceded guilt or even expressed sorrow for the ongoing sickness and deaths that her actions helped bring about, she has repeatedly defended the actions of herself and the EPA in general. Statements that EPA officials made after 9-11 were based on the judgment of experienced environmental and health professionals at EPA, OSHA, and the CDC, who had analyzed the test data that 13 different organizations and agencies were collecting in Lower Manhattan. I do not recall any EPA scientist or experts responsible for reviewing this data ever advising me that the test data from Lower Manhattan showed that the air or water propose long-term health risks for the general public. Whitman's lies are not just those of another self-serving politician looking to save their job or stay out of jail. They are the lies of someone who has contributed to the deteriorating health and even the death of thousands of innocent men and women. For the victims of Christine Todd Whitman, the EPA, the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and all of the other agencies and officers who lied to the public about the health risks in New York, 9-11 is not a single day of horror that occurred a decade and a half ago. It is a slowly unfolding nightmare, one that every day brings them one step closer to their grave. The Dust Lady is one of the icons of the tragedy of that day. Should it be any surprise, then, that she, too, was ravaged by 9-11-related diseases and ultimately died of cancer last year? She was not the first person to die from the aftermath of 9-11. And, 
Thanks to Christine Todd Whitman and the liars at the EPA who have consigned untold thousands to a similar fate, she will not be the last. My name's David Miller. On September 11, 2001, along with hundreds of my fellow troops, I went to Ground Zero. No one asked us, no orders were given. We went because our city, our country, our neighbors were under attack. And we knew what to do, or at least we thought we did. On September 13th, we marched back in, in groups of twos and threes at first, and then dozens until there must have been more than 200 of us, carrying ropes, ladders, tools of every kind, back into the smoke and the poison and rubble where we reached an intersection with hundreds of civilians cheering us on. Our uniforms were torn and soiled. Our resolve was simple, to stay and dig as long as we had any hope to save anybody. I want to tell you about how sick so many of these brave men and women have become. I want to tell you about how the mayor refused to accept the fact that not dozens, not hundreds, but many thousands of us were contaminated, sickened and poisoned by the most toxic combinations of building materials in the history of disaster relief. And that for five terrible years, he ignored that fact. Five years of our family members watching us drop dead. And every time popular mechanics calls the people of this movement nuts, these propagandists, professional liars and tools who cannot even by any stretch of the imagination be considered journalists, strike another nail into the coffin of another rescue worker. I'm actually, I actually figure very largely in a number of the key conspiracy theories. The fact of the matter is we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. 